we're not going to push for democracy per se in the sense of right, uh, free vote and all of that. But democracy here means rule of law. You have to have predictability if you want to thrive in an economy. So talk about rule of law, right? You're going to re revert back to the liberal part of liberal democracy and, and establish uh, the legal setup, go back to what you used to have in, on that front. That's what democracy means, interpreted in that way. Hi, friends and fellows. Welcome to this special series of conversations involving personalities coming from a number of campuses, including Stanford University. The purpose of the series is really to unleash thought-provoking ideas that I think would be of tremendous value to you. I want to thank you for your support so far, and welcome to this special series. Hi, everyone. Uh, today we're visited by Professor Kyoteru Sutsui. He is a professor of sociology at Stanford University, but he's also a senior fellow at APARC, and he's also uh, the co-director for the Center of Human Rights and International Justice. Kyo, thank you so much for making it. Thank you for having me. You've, you've written so many publications and books. Uh, one of the most uh, outstanding ones uh, is uh, your book, Rights Make Might. Uh, I want to basically ask you uh, about some of the stuff you talked about in that book. Uh, talk, talk about how the issue of human rights in the context of some of the minorities in Japan, the, the Ainus, the Burakumis, and the Koreans, have evolved uh, in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, so the book, the context for that book is... Um, this is a topic that I have been studying since my you know, dissertation, PhD dissertation. Um, and it, it kind of follows up on the debate about the efficacy of international human rights institutions, like international human rights treaties, whether they serve any purposes, whether they actually do have um, some impact on the ground. And I've done a lot of, um, uh, before the book, I had done some quantitative cross-national analysis, looking at the impact of, um, looking at whether uh, states, governments that have ratified international human rights treaties have um, improved the actual practices. And there's still ongoing debates about whether the impact is positive, positive or neutral or even negative. Um, around the times I was doing my uh, dissertation around the turn of the 21st century, Around that time, there was a lot of um, um, skepticism about the actual impact of treaties, and it was quite well-founded because um, a lot of countries um, that ratified uh, those key treaties, international uh, UN-sponsored human rights treaties, a lot of those countries were um, not particularly um, good, you know, human rights-y kind of countries because uh, it's a lot easier for them to ratify those treaties in, in countries like the United States or the you know, U.S. is infamous right. for not having ratified some of the most important human rights treaties, right? But there's a reason for that. It's hard for uh, rule of law countries like U.S. Right. or Japan to, to ratify. There's a real process, right? Whereas if, if there's a dictator in certain country in, in like Africa, it's easy for that person to go to the U.N., promises, sign the treaty, and then bring it back. There's no ratification process, right? Then... Um, so there were a lot of countries that actually did not um, um, deliver on the promise that they made when they ratified those treaties. So, so at that point, um, the, the relationship was not particularly good. But the impact of human rights treaties was mediated by civil society linkage. So the key findings in this, that series of analysis that I did early on in my career is that if there's a vibrant civil society in that country uh, whose government has ratified those treaties, or if the uh, country is open and there's international NGOs that can go in right. and push the government to deliver on the promise that they made when they ratified those treaties, then actually indirectly, right, not directly by just ratifying the treaties, but indirectly 
treaties could have some positive impact in improving the actual practice, right? Um, so then I, so I did this quantitative analysis, and then I wanted to get to the bottom of the actual mechanisms and processes in which these impacts kind of uh, unfold. And I'm from Japan. I knew right. a little bit about Japan. And, uh, and really, originally, I got interested in those issues because I observed around me this kind of a hidden uh, minority groups, often called hidden minorities in Japan, um, that are um, not not often very open in the public, but it's still ethnic minority, not, I wouldn't call it ethnic, but minority politics in Japan. And then I started looking into those cases. And then I looked at uh, three, these are the most uh, salient minority groups in Japan, Ainu, right. indigenous, indigenous people, uh, Korean, Dainichi Koreans, right. um, uh, colonial legacy kind of group, and the Brahmin, former outcast group. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at the trajectory of these three groups and how Japan's uh, participation mm -hmm. in the international human rights regime uh, in the form of ratification of key treaties and participation in the Commission on Human Rights, today Human Rights Council, how those things actually shaped minority politics in Japan and really changed the course of uh, groups like Ainu, which... Yeah. You know, I knew it was very, very dormant politically. Mm. They didn't want to engage in a lot of politics. Uh, but since the 70s, they got exposed to international human rights norms, especially international indigenous rights movement. And then they became more active and then they became quite successful. I'm not suggesting everything's perfect for Ainu mm. today, but they have achieved quite a bit considering where they were in the 1970s before Japan got exposed to international human rights treaties. So I can say more about these groups, but yeah. that's kind of like a real the big picture story of that book. Do, do you see the role of civil society and non-state actors as things that are sustainable in the long run mm -hmm. in, in making sure that there's this empowerment yeah. of the actors as to help improve human rights, mm -hmm. not just in Japan, but hopefully globally? Mm -hmm. That is a critical question today, yeah. especially. Yeah. Because... Um, so the international human rights regime um, grew, well, since 19, 1948, 1945, UN, UN Charter, 1948, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, mm -hmm. and then 1966 to um, key in, international covenants uh, on civil and political rights and also economic, social, and cultural rights. Right. Those got adopted. Um, but really, people like point to the 1970s as kind of a takeoff point. Um, and if you look at statistics on how many... Uh, human rights treaties exist, how many countries have become party states to those treaties, right. and also how many uh, international human rights NGOs existed. Since the 70s, 80s, the number has exploded on all counts. Um, and what happened in those um, decades, 70s, 80s, 90s, really, th that's when uh, institution building took place. Right. And the ideas about, with the institution, ideas about human rights spread right. to the, throughout the world, empowered a lot of civil society actors across the globe into activism. And in the, seven, in the 90s, right, Cold War ended. Cold War created a lot of gridlock right. in the international institutions about advancement of human rights. Um, so it was kind of activities, global activities on human rights were limited mostly to institution building, right? But, but they worked hard on institution building that paid off after the Cold War ended. And 90s was, the 90s was a kind of golden era of human rights, despite some uh, g genocide yeah. cases that couldn't be prevented. In general, the 90s was a good era for global human rights and civil society activities really took off. Um, then 9-11 happens, terrorist attacks, and then U.S., Go, go into, uh, goes into this mode of mm. war on terror. Uh, and, and then uh, 2008 financial crisis and all that, um, and the rise of uh, uh, what we call illiberal right. states, China's rising, Russia's coming back, right. and their influence in um, the global South uh, have also expand, um, uh, expanded. And um, that creates a lot of challenge. But what we have today is what you pointed to, uh, out, which is that um, international civil society has been empowered. And that's the, the sustaining that is critical. And it's hard because, you know, the states still have the monopoly of uh, legitimate, legitimate right. use of force. 
So uh, a lot of states can actually suppress those civil society activities, and, and they are suppressing, especially with the rise of illiberal states, which, didn't, which do not want to hear right. dissents uh, in, in, in openly. Um, so the challenge really today is to, but, but what's, what's encouraging is that because of this institution building era, because of the 90s, this golden era for human rights, um, the ideas of human rights, universal human rights, right. that everybody is entitled, entitled to basic fundamental human rights, right? They cannot, they should not be put to prison, put into prison just because of their political opinions. Those right. kinds of ideas are out there. Um, so a lot of people in the world have um, internalized that, mm. right? So the ideas are out there. Many more people have uh, that understanding. But um, so that I think the next decade is critical. But there's this rise of illiberal powers, and they begin to, in a sinister way, suppress those ideas or spread. Uh, they engage in disinformation work right. to shift their understandings. Um so in the next decade, we really need to ensure the um, vibrancy of this civil society space domestically in those countries, but also internationally, um, will continue. Because otherwise, right, these ideas might actually wilt mm. in the face of this strong uh, counterattack, counteroffensive by illiberal states. There just seems to be a structural challenge mm -hmm. because you, you've alluded to the need for this sort of initiative being multilateralized, mm -hmm. right? And and you you aptly pointed out that the 90s would have been the golden era mm -hmm. when human rights was being propagated in a good way. Fortunately or unfortunately, that was the era when the global order would have been unipolar. Right. And I, I've always talked about how unipolarity made multilateralization. Mm -hmm a lot easier. Mm -hmm. However, ever since we started multilateralizing, a multipolarizing multilateralization has become somewhat more difficult. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as, as a challenge then for not just the non-state, but also the states, the state actors to basically play a play part in promoting human rights regionally, locally, or even globally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, um, much has been said about the state of the, the international liberal. Right order um, and human rights was developed squarely in that tradition, right? The United, United States, UK, those countries um, pushed for human rights, inclusion of human rights in the post-World War II international order. Um, and they constituted the backbone of, um, um, of the international liberal order. And what's been happening in the last I don't know, six, seven, eight years is um, the UK pulled out of EU, uh, United States had Trump era, uh, America first. Right. Even though President Trump is no longer in power, you know, there's some continuation of um, President Biden wouldn't say America first. He says America's back and going right. back to multilateral forums. So it's an improvement. Yeah. But still there's this remnant of Trump era, America right. first mindset uh, in some people. And you know, nobody expects the United States to go back to something like CPTPP, for instance, right? Um, so the international liberal order needs other parties to really um, uphold uh, its, its ideal. And uh, countries like Japan, uh, uh, Germany, they're, they're doing their share. But to your point, um, it, it really needs multilateral right. institutions to sustain that. And, and thankfully, especially for human rights, mm. the efforts to um, multilateralize uh, uh, these effort, uh, uh, these institutions have been in existence really since the early period. Because when the Universal Declaration was adopted, there were efforts to include, I mean, even in those days when uh, Western powers were quite dominant, there were efforts to include non-Western voices in drafting of that document, for instance. Um, and you know, from early on, um, so once the uh, UDH Universal Declaration of Human Rights got adopted, then it was supposed to be turned into treaties. Um, and then it took a long time because mm -hmm. there was the Cold War and the Soviet, the Soviet bloc and the US bloc right. couldn't agree on what rights are human rights. And then in, in this era, it was actually what we call the Global South countries today that, that were really pushing for yeah. human rights. 
uh, they they what they meant was more self determination, right? uh, decolonization. But really, they also use the language of human rights, right? So their voices were heard from early on, and then the anti apartheid movement was central in that era, right? Um, and and you know it was housed in all these efforts were housed in the United Nations mm. multilateral institutions, right? Global institutions, and there were some regional efforts like in Europe and in the Americas, in Africa. But a lot of these efforts to establish human rights, because human rights was seen as universal, right? it's a universal mm. principle. Democracy may be a little bit different, but human rights is universal, right. and every it applies to every single human being in the world. So it, it, I think it's from in its DNA is this multilateral component. So that's an advantage. So even today, a lot of the activities, and even in the 90s, with the unipolar power era, yeah. it was helpful that the U.S. was supportive of human rights, and U.S. saw that human rights as an important component of the world order at the time. Um, but it wasn't just the United States. The U.S. was criticized. And when 9-11 happened and the U.S. engaged in war on terror, condoning to- torture, basically, right. right? Then U.S. got harshly criticized, mm-hmm. right? So it, it's always multilateral. Um, and even today, too, it, it's multilateral. So that is there. And I think that might be uh, one strength that uh, human rights, global human rights institutions have that um, can, you know, sustain these global efforts to, to move forward. And I couldn't say the same about something like democracy, because democracy is seen more as American or Western yeah. conceptualization of governance. I, I want to talk about democracy, but mm-hmm. uh, I want to revert back to Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, a prominent Japanese, uh, Taro Aso, mm-hmm. uh, had made a statement that no great civilization uh, could last thousands of years without heterogeneity. Right. Uh, the work you've done and others have done in the context of what the Burakumis, the Koreans, and the Ainus would have to do uh, and would have to become. Uh, in the context of how Japan has always tried to maintain homogeneity, at least in the perception of the outsiders, right? And you put that in a bucket of how demographically you're getting less youthful. Mm-hmm population decline and all that. Mm -hmm. Do you see Japan in the coming decades as a nation that's likely to become more Mm open-minded, more uh, heterogeneous, or something that would be more sticky with the legacy or the past? I think Japan has to become uh, heterogeneous. Um, So let's take a step back and look at the modern history of Japan, right? So Japan becomes a modern state in 1868 with the Meiji Restoration. And, and there were, you know, people in northern parts of what became Japan spoke rather different language than people in the southern, right? So the dialects were very powerful. And so there was this effort, peasants into Frenchmen type of process of uh, homogenizing the nation into a modern state. Once that's going, um, then um, this colonization right, by Japan um, to keep up with the West is was the argument uh, started. And then Japan became a multi-ethnic, multicultural empire, right? That was Japan before 1945. So there was, um, so initially there was this, in Meiji Japan, there was some arguments about Japan's homogeneity or cultural unity, but once it became necessary to frame Japan as multi-ethnic empire, then that discourse took hold. So pe- before 1945, um, there was a recognition that Japan is a multi-ethnic, united under the emperor, but, yeah. but you know, different ethnic groups existed um, from the Japanese perspective har- harmoniously, right? right? That's not how it was seen in other parts of Asia, but that's, that's kind of how they framed the existence of Japan at the time. Mm-hmm. Then the war ends in defeat, and then Japan's, Japanese territory now is contained to the main mainland Japan and Hokkaido and right, up to Okinawa, right. then Japan had to come come to this different ideology about the nation, and then homogeneous Japan became that idea ideology, and that was reinforced by um, Japan's success, yeah. right? And this 1986 famous statement statement by then Prime Minister Nakasone right. about how you know that that's a heyday of mm-hmm. the height of Japanese economic might, right? Japan was 
gobbling up properties in the U.S., Rockefeller Center, Hyatt Studios, Pebble Beach Golf Course. Um, and at the height of that hubris, Prime Minister talked about how um, Japan is so successful because it's a homogeneous nation. The United States, multi-ethnic countries like the United States uh, are pulled down by the ex existence of minority groups, right? Uh, that faced a lot of backlash, obviously, mm -hmm. but that was kind of the mindset in Japan when at that time. And that didn't change very quickly, right? Um, but by now, somebody like uh, Taro Aso, yeah. um, 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 he's not the... Um, a lot of people see him as a more conservative person, right? But even somebody like him recognizes because of the economic needs, um, Japan has to take on two things. One is to include more women in the labor force and in the prominent positions, right? There are a lot of talented women in Japan who cannot really utilize, uh, show, show their talents mm -hmm. domestically. A lot of people actually go abroad, come to the United States to become successful, right? Uh, so, but, but Japan should be able to... Um, tap into that, that female resources. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second is uh, immigration, right? And, and Japan, there's this reality of dwindling population. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the Japanese government has been trying to increase the fertility rate and all that, but um, there's limits to what the government can do on that front. So uh, taking on more migrant labor um, is critical but it's challenging because Japan's post-war institution are built based on largely homogeneity right. of the nation. So Japan was not quite set up to, in, to invite people from abroad, especially talented people from abroad. Skilled labor is what the, the government wants. But skilled labor from or Asia, Southeast Asian countries, have other more attractive places to go, like the United States or, or South Korea or Europe. So uh, Singapore, right, Hong Kong. So um, Japan has to do a lot of work to make it uh, attractive for skilled labor from other parts of the world, especially Asia, um, and to attract them. And I think Tokyo has changed quite a bit. If you go to Tokyo today, it's it's oh, quite yeah. quite diverse. You just see it on the streets. It's, it's yeah, more cosmopolitan, right, yeah. than it used to be. Yeah. Um, so, so it, it, it's happening, but it has to happen more quickly, is, is my view, to, for Japan to keep up. You, you mentioned democracy, and, and I want to broaden the discussion in the context of what's happening between the U.S. and China, mm -hmm. right? And while your population is likely to decline and China's rise seems to be inevitable, and we've sort of like reached the end of the strategic ambiguity mm -hmm. era, right? What, what do you think is Japan likely to undertake in the next few years, if mm -hmm. not decades, mm -hmm. in this context? Yeah, so I, I make the argument that 2022 was a very, very important yeah. year for, for Japan, for the world. Um, democracies in the world in particular, because um, there has been what my colleague Larry Diamond calls a democratic recession. Right. Um, and uh, I mean, if you put it in the historical context, that, that and then people look at statistics from uh, Freedom House Index or mm. right, VDEM, and um, I mean, if you look at 200 year arc of right. development of democracy, I mean, it's still on the rise and the de recent decline is kind of marginal. Right. But if you magnify the last 20 years, right, 21st century, then it, the decline is quite steep, right? Okay. So and it's, it's especially concerning because um, the shining beacon, yeah. for, right, uh, democracy, you know, the United States has to fix its uh, right, no house problems. in order, right? Uh, um, and, and you go to China and they're, they're very confident about their governance model. Wow. Right. And, you know, they have something to show for. I mean, COVID and all that changed a little bit, but right. they have something to show for. Uh, and Belt and Road Initiative and all of that, it was expanding. So before 2022, there was a lot of, uh, and, and during the COVID initially, China mm. seemed to be doing better than clearly in terms of looking at the number of right. deaths, although statistics might not be that trustworthy. Right. Um, so there were a lot of concerns. And then 2022 comes along mm. and, and President Putin invades Ukraine, 
that changed the dynamic and and like NATO, which uh, President Macron said uh, was brain dead, uh, right. came back strong, right. reunited, reinvigorated, new members are joining um, NATO, and uh, consolidation of this democratic alliance right, right. is is now powerful. Um, China. Zero COVID policy it was right uh, yeah. showing its limits, and um, President Xi seemed to want to stick to that, but he realized that he had to make a change. So right, um, so a lot of things changed in 2022, and its impact, especially the Ukraine uh, impact of Ukraine, yeah. w- quickly was seen in Germany, where Germ- Germany decided to uh, double or increase the defense budget to right, up to 2%. Um, and Japan followed, somewhat slower, but Japan followed. Yeah. And it was a big year for Japan because, um, and what's interesting is, you know, since especially President, uh, Prime Minister Abe, right. um, the Japanese government has been wanting to expand its budget, defense budget and, and its, its military capabilities because, you know, China's threat was felt by Japan much earlier than it was in the United States. So Japan has for a long time been wanting to prepare for that. Um, but there was this, you know, domestic resistance, if not a strong opposition, domestic resistance was, was quite powerful in Japan for a long time. Now, after seeing Ukraine and, and the argument right, against uh, Japan expanding its, its, its defense capacity is, well, we live in the era where mm. nobody's going to invade uh, a, a, another country to change the national borders. That's that came. That's 20th century. Mm-hmm. Nobody does that anymore. Well, it's proven mm-hmm. to be completely wrong, right? right? So people saw that. And in Russia and China are different, but people in Japan see what Russia did to Ukraine and then look at China's defense, um, military budget increases and military capacity right. expanding right, exponentially. And look at that reality and think, uh, well, this could happen in East Asia. And then um, the public mindset, I think, changed. Mm -hmm. So what's what's more surprising to me in what happened in 2022 was not not just, not that the government changed its (laughs) defense mindset, but the public was quite supportive of the new approach by the government. And there was not too much resistance to defense budget increase uh, to 2%. Um, I and mean, there's a lot of debates about where that money is coming from. And there's some opposition to tax increase, a strong opposition to tax mm-hmm. increase and all that. But the idea of Japan um, expanding its military capacity, defense capacity and defense budget, um, that uh, does not see us. I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting there's no opposition, but right. the uh, majority it's seem inevitable. to agree that that's what Japan needs right now. So that's that's what happened with Ukraine in 2020. If, if we saw what happened in a Congress mm-hmm. meeting a few months ago in China, there seemed to be a lot less collective leadership in China, mm-hmm. right? Which kind of like would entail inevitably a greater degree of risk for not just Northeast Asia, but all of Asia, right? Mm -hmm. But you juxtapose that with some of the earlier or recent observations where Xi Jinping has shown a capacity and ability to make a Mm U-turn, right? Including on a zero COVID policy, right? So I don't know which camp I want to be in, right? Mm -hmm. But What's what's the risk of a Taiwan invasion mm-hmm. occurring, mm-hmm. and and how that would bode for you know Japan's militarized militarization yeah. going forward? Yeah, so that's something that I um, I've been thinking a lot of, um, and I think you have Oriana Mastro. Right, your podcast at some point soon, and yeah. she. So Larry Diamond, Frank, we had Frank Fukuyama. Right, uh, we were just in Japan to talk to key policymakers um, uh, about the particular topic because that's on on their mind as well, right? Um, and Americans also want to understand where Japan is on that. So uh, somebody like Oriana is her observation 
is um, her, her assessment is that um, it's likely to happen before 2027, right? China's mm-hmm. attack on Taiwan. Um, people in Japan have, China experts in Japan, have somewhat different views about it. And mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not an expert. I, I'm not a military expert. I'm not a China expert. So I don't really know who's, who's right or who's wrong. Um, but these, these are estimates, assessments, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I, I think I generally agree with Oriana that we have to be prepared for the worst and we mm-hmm. have to try to deter China mm-hmm. from doing things. Um, I, I think most people in Japan, despite what Putin did to Ukraine, still think that uh, China, is a, uh, China doesn't like to take great risk Right, and it's probably true that China is a careful country, very yeah. cautious and rash, or generally rational country. Um, but as you alluded to, the recent Party Congress um, got even some China experts in Japan nervous because yeah. of the consolidation of power, and also because um, um, pr- President Xi dropped a lot of key economic advisors. It seemed as if he doesn't, he doesn't care about. He doesn't economy. care. He doesn't worry about it. If, he if cares it, more about the legacy. Yeah. And if if the Chinese economy start, starts to tank and um, people are unhappy, right, this diversion of attention to Taiwan might be a, become an attractive option for President Xi. Um, so there are all kinds of different scenarios that could um, unfold. But um, the direction that, the, that he took in party congress was not, Particularly reassuring, so uh, I think there are more people in more people in Japan are concerned about this. But in general, I think the the uh, assessment is a little bit different. The U.S. side sees it more likely. I mean, not everybody in the U.S. is thinks the same as Oriana, but but you know, in general, I think U.S. side um, thinks it's more likely that Xi Jinping would do something on Taiwan, whereas people in Japan are more. Um, less worried about this as a real um, possibility. Um, but having said that, I think uh, policymakers in Japan are obviously thinking about it, and that's their job, right? And they're doing a good job of uh, evaluating the situation and preparing for the worst. So the sense I get um, talking to really highest level officials in Japan is that... Um, they are careful what they say. I mean, the reality is Japan's right next to China, right? <laughs> U.S. is the Pacific Ocean away, right? So it's understandable Japan has to be a little bit more careful, right, right. In, in not to provoke China un- unnecessarily. Um, economic relations also, right, are important. Oh, right. I mean, it's important to everybody in the world, including the United States, but Japan is right next to it, and, and it's the biggest, China's the biggest trade partner. Um, so um, there's there's reason to be cautious, but I but I got the sense that behind the scenes they mm-hmm. are really worried and they are uh, trying to make some um, do some prep work for that. Uh, but whether that's enough or not, people. I mean, I don't think Oriana would think that it's enough. What Japan is, it's, Oriana doesn't think what U.S. is doing is not enough. So there's more to be done, certainly. But um, the, the Japanese leaders cannot come out and say, oh, well, China, if you go down China, we're going to shoot down your vessels in the Taiwan Strait. The United States, Japanese government cannot say that. Right? So yeah. they're not going to come out and say that. But, but they are looking at different scenarios. They're doing a lot of war games um, and doing the work of, um, especially uh, legislative kind of work. Right? They, they have to do, Japan has this constitution, Article 9. And there's a lot of reinterpretation of that. And Prime Minister Abe um, prepared for a lot of that in 2015 when he changed, uh, passed a new law. Um, but to prepare for, and what's important is that Japan has to make a move very quickly if it happens in Taiwan. Because U.S. is not as as close, right? right? And U.S. base is right. in Okinawa, but Japan is closer. So, um so that, that's an important component to prepare for a very quick move if it happens within 24, 48 hours kind of move that Japan um, needs to prepare to do. So, so that's, the, 
that's the sense I got in Japan is people are thinking about it, but not quite making the making the move. I mean, God forbid. I mean, if if you think Japan is not adequately prepared, you would also agree with the fact that the United States is also not、mm-hmm. adequately prepared for this catastrophic. Scenario,、mm-hmm. God forbid, but I'm I'm still sort of in the camp that still sticks to the idea that this, from an economic standpoint at least, the interconnected nature between China and the U.S. is so massive. We're talking about what seven to eight hundred billion dollars worth、mm-hmm. of collective trade, right? Not to mention China's interconnectedness with the other guys that are vested in this being of. Peace and stability. It just seems not likely that they would do something this crazy, right? But who's to say, right? No.、Oh. And and some would also argue that you know he is sort of like persistent on making this a legacy of his、mm-hmm. you know administration.、Mm-hmm. I I want to jump. To Southeast Asia,、mm-hmm. which I know you've been working a lot on. Also,、uh, Japan has been known as a projector of soft power through courtesy,、mm-hmm. which which is really good, I think, for Southeast Asia. I mean, you've been a a major mobilizer of monetary capital, economic capital, and also technological capital.、Mm-hmm. Talk about this,、mm-hmm. you know, vis a vis what. Other countries are trying to do with Southeast Asia, particularly China.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Japan, it's it's not as if Japan Japanese people are so nice that they they, <laughs> they just organically became nice to Southeast Asia and then took different approach than the U.S. or China. It I mean maybe some of that I can believe, but、uh, I I wouldn't put that out there.、Um, so it was by necessity Japan became、uh, what I call the courteous power in Southeast Asia、um, because of the history before 1945, right? Uh, and there was this、uh, Tanaka riot right, right. and all、in、that, 70s, and yeah. yeah, and Japan learned its lesson and issued this、uh, this Fukuda doctrine to talk about Japan's approach to Southeast Asia, which is what I characterize as courteous. Right, Japan would be a、um, supporter,、uh, provide economic aid, provide consultation, trying to f- get the sense of what、um, Southeast Asian countries want. And deep sense of respect for ASEAN's operation, its autonomy.、Um, so that's really、um, like a, there was a learning curve, right? Learning process. And by the time of the Fukuda Doctrine, Japan took that approach and stuck with it, and it, it's continuing on today. And I think it's a really good approach, and and it got、um, um, a lot of、um, support of Southeast Asians. If you look at a lot of opinion poll, public opinion polls today. Uh, Japan has a lot of、uh, people's trust in、right. in the region.、Um, I mean, when I published、uh, my with my colleague John Chirachari this co-edited volume, the Korean Power, people were asking me like, "Okay, so it's nice that Japan's respected, but how how do you how how is Japan going to cash in on that?" That's that's a tough question because、uh, right. you know trust is not something that you. Try to earn and thinking that you cash it in at some point, right? If you if it's obvious, you don't gain trust, right?、Uh, so I think Japan really genuinely, since the Fukuda Doctrine, tried to assist Southeast Asian countries. Also, Japan in the 70s and 80s was、uh, economic superpower in right. 75 percent of the economy in Asia、uh, was Japan at the time. So、um, so Japan could afford to take the position in the flying geese model, and all of that was there, right? I mean, so things changed with the China's rise. Now China is a bigger, bigger economy, arguably more influential. Although, as you point out, in terms of stock of investment, Japan still is the biggest, right? Uh, right. more than China.、Um, so、um, this this courteous approach、um, was very effective. Started by necessity, but has been very effective, and、um, it, it is. Also effective because Japan did not interfere in domestic politics, ASEAN affairs, but also each country's domestic affairs. There was very little of、uh, in the way of conditionality that other Western nations、um, attached to any kind of economic agreements.、Um, and Japan had been has been criticized for that. Right, you just give money without trying to 
expand democracy or human rights right. in those countries. Um, in hindsight, uh, right today, people actually think that maybe, maybe that was not so bad um, because the way countries like, like the United States push for democracy in the region yeah. um, backfired, right? So um, I mean, even today, Japan is hesitant to criticize countries like, like Myanmar, right? right? Well, from my point of view, if, if it gets to Myanmar, yeah. Ooh, you kind of have to be a little bit more assertive. Sensitive. Yeah. Things. But uh, like, like Thailand, right? Could it have happened? And the US was very critical. Japan kind of intervened and tried to smooth things out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Thailand is not exactly back to being a vibrant democracy, perhaps, but. Um, it takes time. Takes time. Takes time. So Japan yeah. understands that uh, because Japan, what. Um, was a receive, recipient of that kind of criticism. Yeah. Your, democ- your democracy is not real democracy because right. it's just one party dominance, right? So Japan is, understands that democracies operate differently right. in different historical contexts. Right. Um, so that's that was Japan has been Japan's approach. And I've been during this trip to Japan uh, a couple of weeks ago. I we met with a JICA official. That I, I've been very impressed with JICA's yeah. approach of listening to local constituents' needs and cater to their needs rather than to dictate, right, the course of uh, economic mm-hmm. aid saying, this is what Japan wants to see, so you right. got to do this. They, they don't say that. They go and listen. And also they complement what other countries do. China, U.S. have their own approach to investment and aid. And Japan's approach is to see what they're doing and say, okay, this is an area that U.S. and China are not quite helping, so we will go in and help in that area. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I think, um, and in terms of re- resources, Japan doesn't have the kind of resource that it did in the 80s. So, the, um, you know, the amount of aid and investment today mm-hmm. might be less than China or the U.S., but um, it, it's done, I think, in a very smart way yeah. of targeting different. I, I want to put this in the context of the degree to which monetary capital has been mm-hmm. mobilized from liberal democracy countries to countries in Southeast Asia that want to be better liberal democracies. Mm-hmm. We've, we've kind of like talked about this separately before, but if you take a look at countries like Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines, their FDI on a per capita per year basis would be within the range of 100 to $400 on a per capita per year mm-hmm. basis for each, respectively. Mm-hmm. Compare that with Singapore. They've been able to get $19,000 worth of FDI mm-hmm. on a per capita per year basis. Mm-hmm. Th- there is this argument that Singapore is a tiny country, mm-hmm. but even with 5.5 million people, they were able to get $105 billion worth of FDI compared to the next largest recipient, which is Indonesia, mm-hmm. at about $31 billion. Mm. So the, the argument of Singapore being smaller is not sufficient. Mm. It sort of collapses. And it, it really boils down to how Singapore has been able to promote and enforce rule of law, mm-hmm. really. That's, that's what it boils down to. Yeah. So if, if you're a big liberal democracy country like the United States or Japan, you want to see some or many or all mm-hmm. of Southeast Asia becoming better, if not more robust liberal democracies, mm-hmm. you need to put food on a table, right? Mm-hmm. Money needs to be deployed a little mm-hmm. bit more, better and faster, particularly for institutional building purposes so that there's better rule of law and all that. Yeah. What, what is your view about this? In, in, in the context of how you want to help promote liberal democracy mm-hmm. in countries like whatever in Southeast Asia that mm-hmm. want to be better liberal democracies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, in the context of this bigger debate about democracies versus authoritarianism in, right. in the world and in, in Asia, yeah. in Southeast Asia, um, well, really in the world, Southeast Asia is critical, right? Those countries are what I would call swing states. These right. are the ones that decide the outcome of this yeah. Um, I mean, there's debate about whether to frame this in terms of this battle between those two sides, two sides, because there are a lot of hybrid models. But let's let's buy into this this confrontation. Right. Then, Southeast Asian countries are critical for the United States, Japan, um, the liberal side, and um, in trying to win 
hearts and minds of Southeast Asia in public, um, it's very important to show that it's beneficial sure. economically. It helps to put food on the table yeah. to take the liberal side, right? And in doing so, um, as you astutely point out, Singapore is a great example, yeah. right? And people still, if you look at democracy statistics, people don't see Singapore as a as a democracy in the yeah. sense of right full um, a multi party competition and, and all of that. But Singapore is a vibrant, um, reasonably liberal liberal in the sense of rule of law, Correct. strength, state. And um, Japanese, like JICA and the Japanese authorities also kind of um, learned that. Yeah. And some of what they're doing, a lot of what they're doing today is to not talk about democracy per se, but talk about rule of law. Yeah. So they spend a lot of resources on legal infrastructure building in, in Southeast Asian countries. And I think it's very wise. I think that's the right, right? approach. Because yeah. if you have the rule of law, you have predictability that brings investment, yeah. as you said. And and that's an important process. And and um, the the, Cardius, the book Cardius Power has a chapter on coup d'état in Thai, in Thailand, mm-hmm. and um, the Japanese government, U.S. government, was criticizing the coup d'état as completely undemocratic. You have to, we have to sever ties with this regime. Mm-hmm. The Japanese government goes in there and and, and talk to the the military regime about how, you know, this is, we're not going to push for democracy per se in the sense of right? Uh, free vote and all of that. But democracy here means rule of law. You have to have predictability if you want to thrive as an economy. Right. So talk about rule of law, right? You're going to re- revert back to the liberal part of the liberal right. democracy and, and establish uh, the legal setup, go back to what you yeah. used to have in, on that front. That's what democracy means, interpreted in that way, right? And then um, the military regime talks about democracy in that sense. And the U.S. government was, okay, they are at least talking about democracy, even if it might mean something different. Right? Right. So liberal democracy in the sense of rule of law is a good sort of uh, marketing right. ploy, if you will, right. to sell to South Asian countries because right. that directly leads to economic benefits, which is critical to make uh, liberal democracy attractive. Because China has been succeeding Right by yeah. putting a lot of investment without any strings attached in terms yeah. of conditionality for democracy, rule of law, human rights, uh, and that that is um, uh, unraveling in some countries yeah. like Sri, Sri Lanka. Yeah. Um, but that needs to be understood more broadly. Correct. That uh, taking, especially the rule of law aspect, and rule of law is something that China wouldn't object to either. Right. China values rule of law too because of economic benefits. Yeah. So that's an area in which um, we can also kind of uh, circumvent this uh, yeah. this crash of uh, liberalism and authoritarianism. Because um, we can all agree on rule of law as being important yeah. in economic transactions. We can't do that without right, some expectations yeah. that contracts are, 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 are observed. So, what I think what makes it at least recently, what's made it difficult is that we keep getting lectured on how to become better liberal democracy by guys that actually, ironically, are not perfect <laughs> themselves, right? right? And on top of that, they're not putting money on the table. Mm-hmm. Having said that, I think the onus is upon us also to mm-hmm. fix our system. But but there is a structural impediment here mm. in in the sense that you know, in the era of post-truth, it's become so tough mm. to align right. power and talent at the rate that people attain a position of leadership in anything through sensationalization as opposed to intellectualization. So I, I think Southeast Asia has got its work cut out in, in trying to beef up its infrastructure so that it can be a better recipient mm-hmm. while, you know, the guys that are deploying monetary capital need to also be more cognizant of the fact that they got to put money on the table. Mm -hmm. So I want to put this in the context of how the region of Southeast Asia with 700 million people, three and a half trillion dollar economy, it's been so peaceful and stable for the last Mm. 2000 years. Yes, there's been skirmishes, frictions and whatever, but the number of casualties is nothing compared to what we might have witnessed in other regions of the world. But it's so tough to get 
somebody's attention in the US with respect to Southeast Asia. Mm. It's so much easier to get somebody's attention on what's happening in China, Japan, South Korea, and India. Mm -hmm. is, is that an observation on your side also? Yeah, I've been somewhat surprised. So I, I, uh, I got educated in, in Japan. Right. And um, you go to Japanese major universities. Uh, I went to Kyoto University. Right. There was an Aung San Suu Kyi office because she spent some years studying wow. at the South Asian Studies Center at Kyoto University. Wow. Um, I mean, that, that was at 90s, so Aung San Suu Kyi was still held up. As a, <laughs> now, now with uh, Rohingya and all that, maybe there's some different perception, but still, she was a hero of heroine of democracy, right? Advancement. And there was a lot of respect for, for her and for Southeast Asia more broadly, because um, a lot of universities had, I mean, it, it has to do with the proximity, right? right? So geographically, Southeast Asia is right there, and, and Japan from very early on, recognize Southeast Asia as an important right. region. Um, somewhat, I think, akin to Latin America is to the United States, because it's, right, it's just in a sort of sphere of influence. Right. Um, so in Japan, it's not hard to find a prominent political scientist or sociologist who focus on, on Southeast Asia. Um, I'm here too, right? We had this uh, James Scott, and he, we had this tradition, Benedict Anderson, Right. A prominent uh, social scientist who were well, focused on Southeast Asia. So um, coming to places like a Asia Pacific Research Center here, I'm a little surprised that um, there are more people studying Southeast Asia. Um, and also, it's it's there's a decoupling because there are a lot of students, right. right, undergraduate and graduate students who are from Southeast Asia who are studying or interested in Southeast Asia, and that's not matched quite by uh, the faculty, number of faculty members. Um, so something needs to be done and it might be different in different universities. Um, so I, I haven't surveyed all the universities in the US, but I think in general, your observation, I agree with your observation that um, um, Americans uh, in academia or, or otherwise have not quite recognized how important Southeast Asia is, especially in thinking about um, this competition with China, I think a lot of Americans are beginning to realize Japan is critical, yeah. especially in think, as they think about um, Taiwan contingencies. Now Japan is emerging as the most important ally. Um, so I think at some point that there should come this um, understanding that um, Southeast Asia is very, very important in the broader competition with with China, which will be ongoing for some years, decades. Um, so I, I think it'll come, I think it's coming and we're both trying to yeah. make, make it happen quicker, um, but uh, it, it has to happen quickly, I think. Yeah. Throughout this conversation, I feel more optimistic about human rights mm -hmm. than I do about what could happen in Taiwan. Mm. I'm more optimistic about what could happen in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. in, in the context of what Japan could do. Mm -hmm. Give us something that makes us feel optimistic about the region of Southeast Asia going forward. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's still a lot of those countries are growing economies yeah. when... Uh, a lot of other countries, Japan, South Korea, and China too, right. are aging, um, potentially declining. China will peak at some point economically, yeah. at some point soon. It's not yeah. going to be like 2050. It's probably peak, going to peak sooner. Yeah. Um, so that's when Southeast Asian countries emerge as um, kind of like a superpower block in, 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 Asian, in the Asian region. And Southeast Asian, Asian countries of ASEAN, right? That served, that has served them quite well, I think. Because right. um, now it's established that it is autonomous. We have to respect ASEAN autonomy. Um, I mean, I think ASEAN has to work on internally, yeah. work on uh, making sure that everybody, because Myanmar is a challenging case, right, right for uh, other countries in ASEAN. Um, but ASEAN's there to wield its influence once uh, the region becomes more powerful economically. 
So uh, I think there's a lot of uh, potential. People are already like looking at Vietnam, for instance, oh, yeah. as, a, as a really quickly Vibrant, growing yeah. right, economic power. Vietnam has now its EV that's... Um, Been fast. Right? It's right across. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's doing quite well, yeah. it seems to me. Um, so um, all these things are happening, the young talents coming up, now being educated, highly in higher education, institutions of higher education. Um, so I think there's a, a, this growth potential yeah. that countries like Japan, South Korea, China are still kind of <laughs> struggling to find. Um is there. So um, I think there's a lot to be optimistic about. Um, yeah. And it, it educated yeah. people, right? Uh, young generations are quite yeah. educated in that region. So that's really um, both very well for the future of Southeast Asia. One, one last question. Uh, you've, you've alluded to the possibility or the need for quad mm-hmm. to be a quad plus. I'm just curious as to why ASEAN was not involved Mm -hmm. in the earlier discussion Mm -hmm. within Quad or amongst Quad members. It's precisely because of respect for ASEAN autonomy, right? It's kind of challenging to... um, um, Some people talk about ASEAN minus, right? So so just, it's hard to move ASEAN as a whole. So let's try and and move some countries that are more sympathetic to something like the Quad. If that's a possibility, then, then the we, things can move forward in that direction. But in general, uh, if I mean, ASEAN as a whole, it's going to be hard to for them to participate in whatever Quad-like activities because right. they are countries who are very close to China. Right? Right. They would oppose that. So it won't be a unanimous decision. And um, so that's that's a challenge. Uh, but it also has to do with kind of like the nature of Quad. I think it today... The history of Quad is interesting. So in 2006 or 7, 7 8, when it emerged, Japan was the more, most uh, forward-leaning. Right. Because Japan faced uh, China's threat right. much earlier, right? Yeah. Uh, or realized China's threat much earlier. And Australia was not going on board, right? right. Initially, it partic- participated, it pulled out, basically. Right. And India was kind of wishy-washy, but it's still there. So, it, you know, it kind of died initially. Right. Then it came back, especially mm-hmm. after Australia faced the ire of China. Um, and then right now, it seems to me like it, it's, uh, it exists to include India, basically, in that alliance of US, Japan, and, and Australia to counter mm-hmm. China's threat. Um, so it's very important that India is part of that. And, right? uh, but India has BRICS and right, different uh, approaches too. So uh, India is a key player there. Yeah. And you know, country like like, like South Korea yeah. is an obvious partner. New oh, Zealand, yeah, you right? that. yeah, and Pacific Islands also, yeah. right? Uh, it's it's these are another swing states, much much smaller than than ASEAN countries, but um, in terms of geopolitics, security, military right. uh, deployment, it's very important. And China understands that. So China goes out there, tries to get Fiji and all those countries, yeah. Marshall Islands. Yeah. Um, so there are different battlegrounds, um, but um, um, so yeah, I mean that that's Southeast Asia is also critical, and um, if there are ways to um, bring I don't know Vietnam yeah. to or Indonesia yeah. to Quad, that would be very powerful. Um, but but I think first we need to think about what exactly Quad, yeah. it's quad is, because it's not a military alliance in, or anything right? yeah. close to that. It's, there's, there's sensitivity, I think, yeah. with what needs to be discussed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so what Quad did well was something like uh, distributing vaccine right. for uh, COVID vaccines and things like that. And you know, that's a good starting point. Yeah. And then we can do probably more to uh, establish Quad as a solid multilateral forum that can do good in the region. And then we can think about expanding it to other countries. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. It was fun. Yeah. Bye. That was Professor Kyoteru Sutsui from Stanford University. Thank you. Inilah Endgame. Great. Thank you so much. Kate. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. That was fun. Uh, that was great. That was great. <laughs> okay. Good. We didn't miss anything, right? No, not, not that <laughs> I can think of. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, um, and I'm going to have dinner with you all. Come on. Good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the noise is amplified. 
I'm trying to amplify that, yeah. I could have spent at least another half hour, <laughs> just so you know. Oh, well, thank you. It was fun. Because I, I thought the quad discussion could have been... Just hold on to this, because yeah. otherwise, it's not like a She plan. has one, I borrowed it yeah. for two minutes, and I said, yeah. oh. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah.